it's the execution. I'm, I'm with you a hundred percent. You know, it's like, that's the thing that separates people who do things, people who make things. That's really what makes society go round and have value are the people that are taking an idea and moving it forward. Welcome to the three o'clock coffee podcast, a place where extraordinary people network together to share meaningful stories that inspire others. Do you have a great story you would like to share with the world? If so, go to 3oClockCoffee.com and sign up today to be on our show. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and tell a friend about the 3 O'Clock Coffee podcast. Welcome to another episode of 3 O'Clock Coffee. And as usual, we always find some extraordinary people. And today is really a special day for me because I read Adam Stern's book. He's a doctor in Boston. And he wrote a book called Committed, and I've been committed to reading it for the past four days. And I just, it's storytelling. I love it. It's awesome. So I want to welcome you to the cafe, Adam. Thank you for showing up today. I appreciate it. Everybody else does. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be chatting with you. Yeah. I, the other day I was on like, Instagram and I see your book feed come through and I'm like, Hey, I'm talking to Adam tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, wow. So you're like famous, you know, it's like, it's awesome. Hey, but before we get started, let me buy you a, a cup of coffee. What would you like? Yeah. So I'm a coffee drinker. It's something I started doing when I was sleep deprived in medical school, actually. And I needed to get myself going. But then I've actually grown to really love coffee. So usually in the mornings I'll have a light roast with just a touch of almond milk, sometimes soy milk. And sometimes after lunch, I'll treat myself if I really feel like it to like a mocha, something that's really sweet, a little bit mm. like a dessert after lunch. A little pick me up, a little sugar. All right. So I'm going to guess, you know, we live here in New England. Adam's from Boston. I'm from Boston. People from Boston call Dunkin' Donuts Dunkies. <laughs> Who's going to Dunkies? And then you have the Starbucks. Or in true Bostonian, they'll say, hey, you want to go to Starbucks? <laughs> so from what you describe, it sounds like you're a Starbucks kind of guy. Is that right? Yeah, I grew up in New York, so I have betrayed my background because I do like Dunkin' now, but I still prefer Starbucks. It's still, it's sort of like, yeah, that's what I got hooked on when I first got started. So Starbucks is as good as it gets for me. Yeah, hooked is the key word there. <laughs> Speaking of coffee, nobody actually knows this, but we are launching our own virtual coffee cafe. Tell me about that. Yes. So I'm launching my own brand of coffee called Three O'Clock Coffee. And we are going to have the different coffee beans, whole bean, coffee, stock, medium, and roast through 3oClockCoffee.com. You can order your own coffee, 3 O'Clock Coffee, in, you know, pound, half pound, so forth, so on, and have custom roasted coffee called three o'clock coffee very cool the merch is expanding in your world that's very cool yeah and so it's called the three o'clock coffee cafe but it'll all tie into three o'clock coffee so when you're hearing this it's go to three o'clock cafe it's all virtual right so kind of cool just happened to come up yeah looking forward to trying that yeah no it's awesome i mean it's just fun right you gotta have fun there's work and then there's fun right speaking of work you're a pretty hard worker you kind of like you're a psychiatrist in mm -hmm. Boston, read about your life. I probably know more about you than you know about you. And likewise, if you read my book, what keeps you going to do, you know, I, I believe it's like, help me out, out, but it's like three day shifts all day long, overnights, days, nights, skipping sleep. How do you do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think part of what you're getting at is the training of a young doctor is pretty rigorous and pretty intense. And you don't get to choose, you know, you get to choose whether you go into medicine or not or psychiatry or not. But, you know, once you're there, it's sort of like you do what you're told. Otherwise, you can leave the program, you know. So I would never choose to do those, you know, 30 hour shifts. I don't I could work like that now, I suppose. And I choose not to, of course. But I do pride myself in a bit of a work ethic in the sense that I, I do think of myself as a self-starter. I like to do projects. I like to have an idea and see it through from just like a kernel of an idea all the way to a, a product or a finished, you know, concept. That kind of thing really appeals to me. So that's just sort of a trait. That's something I've always had, this drive to sort of create and make something, you know, out of nothing. I, I enjoy that. Probably why you wrote a book and 
published it and are passionate about it. And I can completely see that. How do you feel like you wrote a book? It's an interesting feeling when you write a book. You don't do it for the money. <laughs> you do it mm -hmm. for the passion. You do it for a purpose, a cause. What was the one driving thing to say, hey, I'm going to write a book? Yeah, well, I often use writing as a way to process my experience. So, hmm, interesting. you know, I'm familiar with some of your writing and it's sort of uh, skills based, you know, sort of like helping you perform better kind of writing. If I, I don't want to mischaracterize it, but that's my sense of it. And a lot of my writing is starts out being very self-reflective, like this thing happened to me, how do I understand it? Or how can I make sense of it? And then ideally, if I'm able to craft that into something that other people will actually connect with, you know, in some emotional or empathic way, then I feel like I've succeeded as a writer. If it's not then, and it's just for me, then it's more like a journal entry, you know, and that's fine too. There's value in that as well. I admire writers like you that put stuff out that help people become a better version of themselves, you know, so there's roles in all these different kinds of sort of genres I think have a place. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people and you think like, oh, only I'm going through this or I have the best idea and nobody thought of this, but probably at this exact moment, Adam, somebody else was already thinking about <laughs> it because, you know, we get fed information through social media or something that happens. It triggers our memories like, oh, this is a good idea. And it becomes trendy, right? And everybody wants to do it, which is probably the human behavior, I would say, right? Yeah. And I think you're right that ideas are a dime a dozen, right? Like they're all around us. People are having mm -hmm. similar ideas all the time. It's execution. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the, the execution. execution. I'm, I'm with you 100%. <laughs> you know, it's like that's the thing that separates people who do things, people who make things. That's really what makes society go round and have value are the people that are taking an idea and moving it forward. Yeah, that's the unique ability about everybody. And somebody will say to me, oh, I can never do that. Or I'm like, sure you could. And it's like, you'll see them pause and say, really? <laughs> and then maybe I'll kind of walk them through it. I'm like, can you write 500 words a day? Or start with one. Mm -hmm. And just like life, you know, it starts with the one thing first, right? I think you mentioned that in your book. It's the one thing, right? right that makes the difference. Right. Totally agree. That's interesting. Hey, I got a question for you. Being a professional psychiatrist in Boston, mm -hmm. probably one of the best places to be in the world, medical hospitals and so forth. That's my opinion. I mm -hmm. live here, but I think I'm true. What's your thoughts on COVID-19? Long-term effects, two years from now. Yeah, I mean, it's so undefined at this point in terms of how this is going to unfold, right? You know, you can start with the most concrete. You know, we don't really know the physical impacts that the disease has over the long term. It's only been around for a year and a half, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing emergence of long COVID syndromes that are very strange, things like cognitive issues that are making it more difficult for people to think clearly, people not having smell or taste for long periods of time. This is it's definitely a virus that attacks the central nervous system in certain people. And it's a virus that's gone through our society, you know, like a wildfire. And so the number of people that have now been exposed is just so high that even if something, a long-term effect is really low or really rare, it's still potentially going to impact a lot of people. So it's a scary thing that the idea that we don't really know how this will impact us over the long term. From a mental health standpoint, in the last year, there are all sorts of variables. There's the variables of the actual pandemic, but then also like the conditions in which we lived during the pandemic and to some extent continue to live. And so, you know, there was a, a huge upspike in new diagnoses of depression and anxiety that had never existed before. Certain populations, like young girls, for some reason, the suicide rates seem to go up pretty high, pretty fast, which is a tragic thing. Wow. We don't know how this is going to play out over years, right? Your, your question was about long term, and it's, it's so hard to know. Yeah. I almost think that if I had to predict, I think that it will end up being a shared trauma to a certain extent that we all remember in much the same way we remember 9-11. And I wasn't alive, but mm. when people were alive for the Kennedy assassination, things that were shared. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So 9-11 happens. You said you weren't alive. 
then? No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. That was leading to the next thought. I was very oh, much okay. alive like, during 9-11. Like, Woo! Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, <laughs> Because I was going to feel really ancient. <laughs> no, I know. I, as I was saying it, I thought, oh, that's going to sound... I'm putting this sentence out of order, and the, the listener is going to think, or you're going to think that I was... I'm younger than 20 years old or something, you know. No, I was very much alive. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, you're doing really good being a doctor, what you do. I mean, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm not Let's Doogie go with Howser, that. I love it. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Love that show. No, but so 9-11, though, you know, it is something that we remember, right, as everyone who was of age at that time remembers, like, what was their experience that day? What was it like? What was it like? And in fact, it changed how people thought about society for years, probably even still to this day. People have ideas and then reactions to the reactions that the entire nation sort of rebounded back and forth several times between then and now in terms of ideas about all kinds of geopolitical issues, etc. And I can't help but imagine that this pandemic will have that kind of unexpected cascade of events happen, you know, where we are already seeing political divides around this issue. We're seeing behavioral, you know, certain groups are behaving in one way and certain groups in another way and how that is impacting the economy in positive and negative ways and all kinds of unexpected ways. One of the things that I think you have talked about is the impact and the digitization of our society has been accelerated during this pandemic. You know, things like that are, it's just impossible to predict what's that going to look like a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, right? And it's been set in motion. So it's a fascinating thing to think about. Do you have additional thoughts? Yeah. So when I ask somebody or ask myself some of these questions to make my mind think a little bit further, because one year you can kind of think in your mind, you know, what, what's next year going to look like? And it's like, well, I'll probably be in this house or here or this office. And I'll probably be still talking to Adam at the cafe, ordering our coffee. But when you ask the question, what's life going to be 100 years from today? Mm. That changes everything. And it really makes you stop and think, wow. Where will we be in a hundred years from today? Technology wise, the human life. I mean, I just had knee surgery, day surgery, in and out, no big deal. 25 years ago, I'd probably be in the hospital for five days. Mm. Technology is getting better. It's advancing 10 times more every day, which is going to help the human race live longer. I know we have this pandemic, but if they can fix, you know, I'll use me, fix my knees. I can continue to stay in shape. I can continue to be healthy. I'm probably going to live longer than the times when you couldn't do that and you couldn't fix that. And there's detections of preventions and they can find things before it happens. And so it's really remarkable to me to think that way. You know, the kids today that are just being born, right? That when they're 80, it's hard to believe, but they will be 80, the world will be a thousand times advanced than what we saw over the past 40 or 50 years mm -hmm. because technology is going so fast. Yeah, I can begin to feel overwhelmed when I think about that on that scale, right? The number of years, what kind of world, because it's just so hard to predict. It's, I mean, it, it's impossible to, no one could quite predict what it would be like this year you know, if you look at some pop culture references from, let's say, the late 80s, like Back to the Future of what the year 2015 was going to look like, you know, it's really fun and interesting to see. Well, you know, The Simpsons seems to really predict the <laughs> they future. Are good. I don't know if you saw yeah, that. They are really good. But they are really good. They're the most <laughs> accurate of any portrayal I've seen. You know, I guess I like thinking 100 years ahead for conversations because everybody has a different opinion, right? So I had this conversation with a bunch of friends and it was just interesting to hear everybody else's opinion. And it's just not like talk, you know, chatter, you know, blah, 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 right? It's like people really got into it and they thought about it. And it, it just, it makes the mind work and mind think and just the way my mind thinks, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of interesting to, to hear other people's reactions and beliefs yeah. on that. Do you, if you don't mind me turning this around a little bit and asking you a bit more about it, because uh, you're right, it fascinates me. I think my therapist is going to ask me a question here. Hold on, hold on. I think my therapist is going <laughs> to ask me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me anything. Sometimes when I think about the long, long road, and I do think about it in terms of, you know, children and that kind of thing and how, what world they're going to grow up into, 
do you ever think in terms, you know, the technology is advancing, no doubt about that. But what about the world that they're growing up into? Is that even as technology gets better, sometimes I worry that the quality of the world that they're living in, not the standard of quality of life, but like just like the experience of living in that world might be worse sometimes. What do you think? Is it, does that sound at all? I don't know. Do you have that thought ever? I, I'm just revealing what I think. It's reasonable thoughts because, you know, we lived it, we see it. So we're like, gosh, you know, it's, we're not in 1950s where, you know, mom's wearing pearls around her neck and dad's coming home with the briefcase, it's, you know, at, at 430 having dinner, right? I mean, life is so much different. But I also do believe, you know, your future kids, they don't know what they don't know. So they never experienced it. So they're only going to know what they experienced. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like when, you know, my parents may say, you know, when I was your age, we used to walk six feet in snow and walk all the way to school. You know, well, I don't know if they did or not, but you'll hear those stories about back in the day, you know. So I think that'll be stories like that you and I will share. Right. You know, right. and be like, well, you know. Back of the day. I'm not one of those guys that wants to go back to the 1950s. I do just worry. Sometimes I just worry about, sometimes it feels like we're going one step forward and two steps back with some of the societal challenges that we face, you know? Yeah. Actually, I know we had a little, we talked about kind of, hey, if you're listening, this is a podcast. We had a format of the show. <laughs> we kind of follow it, but it can go anyway. <laughs> it could go anywhere. It's interesting. You talk about time. Because what keeps me motivated in life, because life can be, we're seeing depression, we're seeing all, all sorts of anxiety, right? Is that in my life, I have 25 year plans. Actually, I have two 25 year plans. Okay. And I have already vision wrote down where I want to be 25 years from today. And I'll write down, I'll be living in a log home in Maine. I will be doing like, I write it down like it already has happened. That's so cool. I really appreciate that. I think that's such a cool technique yeah. to help sort of make concrete a long-term goal, a vision, really, of what you want life to look like. Or, yeah, you know. very vivid. And what has happened as I've studied it is that the people that do do that will accomplish their goals in half the time mm. because their mind's already thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So when you have something in your mind that you want to go, you know, what's a goal without having a, you know, how are you going to accomplish anything without a goal? Right. Mm -hmm. And basically you're creating yourself a goal and you're creating that vision for yourself that you really believe in it and it actually happens. Mm -hmm. So I experienced it being 52 years old. I had a 25 year plan and it's like, wow, I'm here. I did it. I can't mm -hmm. believe it. And I hit 50. And so I live in the now, not looking forward to when I'm 70. Five, but vividly, I know what I'm going to do when I'm 75. And it's kind of cool knowing I totally believe it. This is what's going to happen. This is how I'm going to live my life. And I go down that path. That's great. What's your thoughts as, as a psychologist? <laughs> what's your thoughts on that? It sounds like that, you know, what's most important to me, what I've taken away from your story and your technique there is that it is helpful for you. You know, it helps guide you because like you said, it puts you on a path and all you have to do then is take one step forward, one step forward. And if you notice yourself veer off the path, that might be fine, but you might say, oh, I wonder why I, why I did that. Or is that for good reason? Oh, good. Okay. And that, let's adjust that plan. Or you might notice yourself staying on it and saying, I'm doing it, man. Yeah, this is great. Let's keep it up, you know? And so I think it's a very valuable kind of technique. And then there's another element, I just can't help but say it, which is that there is, I think that we all have to live these two simultaneous lives. One is long-term aimed and one is not even short-term, but rather like in the moment kind of life, right? So mm, I agree. I agree. Really appreciating the experiences that you have as you're having them and practicing gratitude for things that are going well right now, you know, and trying to overcome oh, the gosh, challenges, yeah. the stressors that you're experiencing right now. So I think when things are going great for someone, it's they're thriving on both of those levels. It's remarkable that you say that because I started something two days ago. I'm on day two and every day I'm committed to do, I'm committed. <laughs> That's the name of Adam's book, by the way, committed. <laughs> if you're on Amazon right now, type in committed. I'm committed to do this for 21 days. And I'm on day two and I write the gratitude that I've experienced 
within the past 24 hours. That's great. That's a technique I also use. I use it and I find it very helpful. And there are a couple of days every here and there where I forget to do it. But I find that if I'm on a good streak and I'm doing it regularly, it actually lifts my entire outlook. Yeah, I actually, I get up early nowadays. I love getting up early and I, I was like 4 a.m. early. <laughs> and I spent like 30 minutes writing my gratitude for the day. And it just set me up for the whole day. Mm -hmm. Just like it is now at three o'clock coffee. I'm still have the energy because I'm excited about all the things I want to do. It's not the things that I need to do, but the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Speaking of committed, how did you come up with the name, the cover of the book? That's a great question. I struggled and struggled with it. And eventually we were going back and forth with the editor and trying to come up with a title that captured both the profession, which, you know, it's sort of the book is a little bit of a, a window into how do you become a psychiatrist and also something social that happens in the book and, you know, social connection, right? And, you know, in, in lay terms, commitment is a good thing. It being committed to a goal, to a relationship, whatever it might be, we have such a positive connotation to that. And in psychiatry, commitment can be a very distressing thing. Committed in psychiatry terms, that's like treating someone sometimes against their will or because they have to be in the hospital. And so there was a little bit of intrigue, a double entendre there that I thought worked fairly well from a just, you know, since a lot of us do judge books by their cover, it was a one word thing that might just give someone pause and say, well, what's this about? You know, and they'll see that on the cover, there's a little like medical ID badge. And so they'll, they'll sort of say, okay, this is a story that takes place maybe on a psych unit or, you know, in, in the psychiatry wing of the hospital, that kind of thing. And I don't know, I don't love it. Like it's the best thing that ever has been, you know, thought up, but I think it's a hard thing to come up with a single word or a couple of words that really capture what you're trying to get across. So I think it works okay. I actually think it works fantastic because I believe in not laying it all out for somebody and let the imagination flow. Yeah. So when you tell me about your book, it immediately I ordered it and you said it was committed and okay, so I get it. I'm looking forward to it. I didn't read all the stuff on Amazon because I was going to buy it anyways. And I was looking forward. I, was, I really was. And then the Amazon guy delivered it. And I'm like, I ran out, opened the box. And somebody said, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, my book showed up. I can't wait. I just ordered this book. And oh, well, what'd you get? And I, I took it out of the box and I read the title twice, Committed. And then I went, oh, yes, now I get it. You know, being a psychiatrist, committed. Wow. That was so powerful because I had a completely different perspective on what the book would be about. Mm. I don't know why, you know, I'm committed to 21 days of gratitude of writing about gratitude, right? right? Committed to, and I've only learned this because I've read your book that committed in the psychiatric world is, and, and I know from reading your book, that is a really uh, difficult thing for you. Right. And that started at an early age that it sounds like you, you still kind of struggle with that. I mean, I mean, nobody wants to commit somebody, right? I went into the field to work with people who wanted to work with me, right? And part of the training and part of most professions in psychiatry involve at some point being in that position where you're responsible for temporarily taking away someone's freedom so that you can help them get better, ideally. And that's a heavy responsibility, especially when, I, you know, the book takes place, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And that's a heavy weight for someone who's just sort of right out of medical school. Oh, for sure. So I think that was something that I did struggle with and a sort of theme that went through. Yeah, I know it was definitely a theme that I, I picked up on. And I just, like most people when they read, I was just, I was visually right in the moment. Hey, Adam, I got another question for you. So I got a puppy during COVID and I love him to death. His name's Willie. He's a black lab, seven months old. He's my dream dog. He looks good. Gorgeous. He's a beautiful dog. The problem is he's too smart, in my opinion. <laughs> like, he is so self-aware. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's really interesting, really studying his behaviors and so forth. But have you heard the term COVID puppies? I have heard that, yeah. You want to define it for your uh, listeners? Yeah, so this is what I've been told through my veterinarian. So COVID puppy, little old Willie, <laughs> was growing up right by my desk, and he was always with me. Right. 
and we're in the middle of COVID and I never left the house Mm -hmm. because of technology. I didn't need to. So he never saw me leave. And then when we started to open up and I would have to go out, he's like, hey, buddy, where are you going? Right. And he's out in front of the truck. And I'm like, hey, you can't go. I scoot him into his crate. And he is. He's just pissed off. He's mad. And, you know, he got committed to the crate. And he's not happy. Yeah. So I brought him to the doctor, which was kind of psychiatrist. <laughs> and I have him on meds. Like what regular humans would take as, as patients to relax his anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> So I get to feed, you know, my dog anxiety meds to help him through this COVID yeah. puppy stage, wow. which probably some humans are going through. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, this is profound. It is. I hadn't heard that. Like, I've never heard that story before, but it makes total sense that the dog, these COVID pups are experiencing re-entry stress right just like we are even more so because it's sometimes all they've known it's like dog years and right dog years right it's a there's dog intensity to it right i mean willie does not like to be committed yeah to that crate <laughs> yeah so yeah it's something i gotta work out or he just has to come with me everywhere i go that's all that's all there is to it <laughs> yeah one thing i'll just say is that i I've been wanting to get a dog for so many years now, and it seems like there's always some reason that I can't do it. There's always some life thing, or I'll be moving, or my apartment didn't let it happen, or whatever it is. And, you know, it's been years now, and I, I feel like one of these days I'm going to get a dog, and I just, I'm all for it. I just want to say that to your listeners, that I think, you know, if you can take care of a dog, there's like almost nothing better, right? Would you say that about Willie, even with the yeah. distress that he's in? Absolutely. There's something about just having him around. And today, he's at summer camp. <laughs> yep, he's at, wow. summer, he's at summer camp. He's got an interesting life. Oh, he loves it. I get up early. I have my coffee. He does his thing. And I try to get into my work. And I really need to focus, either writing or preparing for this podcast. And, you know, ruff, 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 every five minutes trying to throw the ball, it's becoming a little bit complicated for me. The last podcast, Willie decided to be on it. Yeah. So I special decided guest. today, <laughs> a special guest, Willie. So I decided today, I, I told him, I said, Willie, do you want to go to summer camp? And he got all excited, like jumped in the truck, loved it. Can't wait to get there. And that's the only thing that he likes when he's on around me. He wants to be with his other puppy friends. So <laughs> I treat him like a child. <laughs> so... Well, that's great. I hope he has a great time at summer camp. Yeah, it's good for me. I'm sorry I won't get to see him on the video here, but, you know, that's... Uh, I know. Next time, I'll bring him to the cafe. Yeah. Yeah. So, I have one final question. I know you're a busy guy. You have appointments, and I'm, like, going back to Grateful. I'm really grateful that you took the time, and it's probably going to be my two-minute Grateful day three as I ride. Thank you. You know, my last question, I really am. I really mean that. If you could tell the younger Adam... What would you tell him? If I could give advice. The younger Adam of yourself, right? To my younger self, what would it be? What would it be? You said that a lot better than me. <laughs> That's part of my gig, you know? Psychiatrists are supposed to take words and reflect them back. So I think that if so I... So, Scott, what I think I'm hearing, I think that you said... No, I'm just kidding. With you. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. See, maybe someday we can just sort of switch jobs for a little while and see how it goes. But you've got it, I think. Yeah, so I, I think if I were giving advice to my younger self, I would want to convey a couple of really important things that I've learned. One is that you should take risks that are aligned with your values that you want to take. I think that for a long time in my life, I probably lived a little bit too closely to what was prescribed of me. You know, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. And I noticed that you can go pretty far along just on inertia and what's expected of you without actually choosing, actively choosing what you want to do in your life. So one piece of advice would certainly be to actively make choices about, I want to take that risk. I want to try this thing. I might fail. That's okay. Get back up and try something else. You know, that's probably the most important thing I would convey. And, you know, the second piece would be it's going to be OK, you know, because I, I can picture a younger version of myself who's just worrying, you know, how's this all going to go? How's this life going to go? And what I would try to convey is even when hard and even when really, really difficult things happen to you, that's just part of life. You're going to be OK. You get through it. You keep going. And those two things together, I think, would be really 
I don't know. I would have, I would have enjoyed my earlier life more than I might have. I don't know. I read your book, Adam. It seems like you had a pretty good earlier life. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I've lived a rich life. That's for sure. You did, including with Goober. We miss Goober. I'm not going to say who Goober is, <laughs> but the readers have to find out who Goober is. I just love that you added that part of the book. Yep. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> so we'll leave that for the listeners to find out. Yeah. A little Easter egg for the, the listeners. There you go. So, Adam, how can somebody find you? Maybe they're, well, first off, you know, Amazon, they can find you on Amazon, buy your book, look up Committed, look up Adam Stearns, Dr. Adam Stearns, and you're going to find Adam's book. But perhaps somebody else wants to get a hold of you, put you in another podcast to help somebody else a lecture. Yeah. What's the best way they can get a hold of you? Yeah. Well, I love to hear from folks on Twitter. I'm at Adam Philip Stern which is with one L in the name Philip. I'm on Instagram at Adam Stern, MD. And I have a website also, www.adamsternmd.com. And there's a little way that you can send me a message there. So those are the three ways. I, and I love to hear from readers, from, from anyone, really. The only thing I'll say is that I've actually, since the books come out, I've had a couple people reach out to say, oh, are you accepting new patients? And I don't do that kind of work. I do a different kind of work at the medical center right now. So that's the one way I don't want to, it's not that I don't want to hear from people, but I can't help them when they reach out in that way. Yeah, maybe a referral or college buddy. Everybody has that. I, I call them poker buddies. My CPA, I'm like, hey, Sean, do you have a poker buddy that can help me with this or that? And right. What are you talking about? I'm like, you know, you poker buddy, your buddy, you got to have yep. a buddy that knows something, something. Yep. And he kind of chuckles. And so I'm sure you have a poker buddy <laughs> that you can refer somebody to. Absolutely. That's just my fun way of talking about it. So <laughs> at that note, well, I'm glad you finished your cup of coffee. I'm more than happy buy another cup of coffee, but we both got to go. We have more appointments, people to see, people to inspire. Most importantly, be grateful for just meeting with great people and great conversations. So that's my message for everybody. Be self-aware. Enjoy the moment. Be in the now, right? The now of being in right now. Don't worry about later on or what happened before. You're going to miss your life. <laughs> so enjoy the now. You got it, Scott. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Scott Kropowski. I'm the host of the 3 O'Clock Coffee Podcast, author and executive business coach. Many small business owners are making things up as they go. I've been there. I've done that. That's what makes entrepreneurs so great. They're willing to take action without seeing the big picture. Totally get it. But once our businesses are up and running, we need a proven framework, a process we can grow and maintain profitability as soon as possible. I like metaphors. I wrote two books using that concept. They're great for storytelling and they help people remember important facts. For example, if your business is like an airplane, when you know how to build the six core parts of your airplane, then your business can fly fast and far, very far. When you join Basecamp Business Coaching, again, basecampbusinesscoaching.com, our program I developed, you will access on-demand courses, live coaching events, and I will personally help you with some core facts to building your airplane or building your business. I'll give you an example. You want to become the leader that people want to follow. You want to build a marketing plan that actually gets you conversions. And like any business, you want to close more sales and serve more people. Optimize your products for revenue and profitability. I just did this myself in my own business. I went from 25 different products and services down to five because it just makes sense. We'll take a look at your business too. Hire the right people and manage the operation effectively. I mean, make sure they show up in person, remote, whatever the case may be. Manage the operations effectively. And of course, protect and increase your cash flow. Just like an airplane. If your airplane runs out of fuel, you gotta crash. If your business runs out of cash, you're gonna go out of business. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, go to BasecampBusinessCoaching.com, take a look at the program and see how we can help you.